When you think about giving an opening statement to the members of the jury, it's important to realize that you've got a particularly important opportunity to persuade them. But the persuasion that goes on here is not the same kind of persuasion that goes on in a closing argument or an appellate argument setting. And so let's think carefully about what it is that you're going to do in opening. Now again, having seen literally thousands of young lawyers stand up and give opening statements, let me tell you what you typically see from somebody who is just beginning. What you typically see is some version of this. Members of the jury, my name is Paul Zweer and I want to thank you for being a uh, jury here today. What we're going to do is we're going to give you now in this opening statement a preview of what it is that we expect the case to show. Now this is not evidence, what I'm going to tell you right now. It's what we expect. It's like a, a picture puzzle box or it is like a map that will show you what it is that's going to go on during the case. Now you're going to hear from a lot of witnesses and you're going to hear a lot of complex testimony. You're going to hear that this is really a pretty complex case about insurance and risk of loss. And as you hear this, what I'd like you to do is to keep an open mind during the proceedings to make sure that you do not decide the case until you've got all of the evidence. Now this is especially important for me as a defense in that I don't go first and they go, I go second. And so keep an open mind and what they've just said it's really not evidence and so keep it open and when you get done I'm sure that you'll decide the case our way. So members of the jury, your job will be to decide on the credibility of the witnesses, to in fact to listen to the judge and judge's instructions and ask you when you get done to return a verdict for the defendant and sit down. Now that opening statement, there are some real natural reasons why you might want to do that. First of all, this is true. It is not evidence what's just going on in openings and it's not evidence for you. Thanking seems to be a very nice kind of a way of getting started. <clears throat> we see it from our politicians who will immediately, you know, when they stand up, they thank the individuals who have uh, backed them and have spoken before they've been there. And so it's kind of common in the public to be expecting some kind of thank you. On the other hand, what a waste of a key first moment to be able to talk to the jury and to grab their attention. And if it's true that jurors are hungry because of the constant dissonance of hearing about this case and being troubled about it, they want to try to make up their minds, they want to know what is your focus, what's your position, how can we start to hear this case from your perspective. And they're hungry to want to know that if they hear a lot of boilerplate nothing, what they're going to do is they lose attention and they, don't st they stop listening and when they start listening from you at the beginning then they're not in, you're not in a good position for the rest of the case. So what I'd like to do is to ask you to consider starting strong and thinking differently about your opening statement. To think about opening statement as an opportunity to more than just give a structure for what opening statement is but to tell your side of the case. And let's talk about then what may be an analogy to help you with what you're doing. Opening statements. Opening statements as opposed to closing arguments. And uh, if I can just say, so many of you start making great closing arguments when you do your opening statements and then you make great opening statements when you do closings. So if you can get this image right at the beginning, you can fix a lot of the problems. The image I have in my mind for opening is much more like a country western song than the jazz analogy that you may think of when you're talking about closings. Country westerns tell stories. They tell clear stories and they have a series of features to them that we can all point to. One is that they have a real down home, unpretentious tone to them. That in fact they've got a theme that is something that again we can hum and think about humming and hopefully will be humming through the case that in fact a country western song has a structure to it that we can start to identify in its st storytelling features. How it is that we can start to identify with the story that's being told and then as we go through the story we start to understand the perspective of that individual and why it is that they've been harmed in the particular case. And then it has again a good rousing finish. So the country western song is an image to have in your mind. It's not overly dramatic, it has a straightforward appeal to it. It's down there as my friend Tom Wiseman, Judge Wiseman says, 
you get it down there where the chickens can get at it. Not that your jurors are chickens, but the idea is that you put it down there in a clear and simple and straightforward way where they can get at what's right and what's wrong. So let's talk about that tone, and I want to make a couple comments to you about how you should think about the tone issues. Remember again that what you're doing now is not giving a speech. And if there is ever a time that you do opening statements without, to be able to do, deal something in the courtroom without notes, now is the time. To be able to go ahead and look the jury directly in the eye and say, members of the jury, this case is about five words and the meaning of those words. It is about the words as per the usual agreement. That's what this case is about. This, these are the five words that were used by a um, person from Minicom, uh, Mr. Lubell, to order some parts for his business, computer parts for the business of Minicom. And when he used those words, as per the usual agreement, he was referring to an agreement that had been reached between the parties in September. And the meaning of those words was informed by that September, agree September agreement when he asked that the goods that were to be delivered were to be insured. So you get it from there, you, you take it, it's open, it's conversational, you look person in the eye and you talk to them directly. None of this, members of the jury, we're here on one of the most important issues about commercial transactions that have ever been talked about. And we're here today to decide whether or not a big company can impress a small company by refusing to pay on its goods. There is no need for that kind of speaking at this early stage. It's because it's frankly too early to argue to be demonstrative. The jurors are looking for your kind of your credibility meter, where you are when you're being most authentic. And so at the beginning of the case, this is a place to talk in a conversational tone, look people in the eye without notes, and tell them what your case is about. That does not mean that you don't speak in a pace that'll allow you to be able to pick your words carefully. Again, we've talked about this in other settings, but remember, to speak in phrases, not whole sentences, to make sure that what you do is you gesture and yet you open yourself up because you're not afraid of what it is that you have to say. And you wanna make sure that what you do is you use measured tones in order to be able to talk to folks directly. And that the public speaking then that you're doing in closing, especially when this case is so important, is to pick those words carefully by setting the metronome of your speech in a pace that allows you to do so. Now, I wanna to talk to you about that if you are the defense in an opening, again, you are likely to be facing an uphill battle because we've already heard about the evidence and the emotion that's in this case from the perspective of the plaintiff. So on opening again, I'd suggest to you that you think carefully about how it is that you can switch folks over to the other side by either ignoring what's been going on, putting it aside, stating your own issue in your own time and in your own voice tone, or by saying something along the lines of members of the jury, now I want to talk to you about what the evidence will be in this case and what it is that the evidence will show to remind the jury that that's what it's about as opposed to from the perspective of the plaintiff. Now, let me tell you, you should tell then a story and tell the story, getting into the story, right from the point of view, the best you can, that's most persuasive to you. I say that, and I don't want you to say that explicitly. Members of the jury, let me tell you a story. No, you don't want to say in your opening that what you're doing is telling a story. You want to simply do it. The telling of the story will trivialize what it is that's going on. And so you want to say, I want to tell you what really happened, or let me tell you what the evidence shows, and then go ahead and do it. You do not need from the time that you move into the storytelling to precede every statement you make with the evidence will show, the evidence will show. Think how awkward that starts to sound. The evidence will show that on January the 6th, Michael Lubell sent a letter to Chris Kay at BMI. And the evidence will show that when he wrote that letter, he was referring to a transaction that had happened in September. And the evidence will show that 
in that transaction in September, he had asked for insurance. You see how ponderous and how tedious that becomes. Whereas if you tell the story of Michael Lebel, it's January the 6th, he's just had a telephone call with Jenny Young. In that telephone call, he called her and reminded of her of the September transaction, and he asked her if she would please insure the goods that are going to be sent to Minicom. This is $500,000 worth of parts, and please handle it as per the usual agreement. And she said, they will insure it, they'll do it. And then he sent a letter, and the letter he sent will show you is Exhibit 20. In fact, let's take a look at that together. And so you do not need to, in order to lay out your case, to juxtapose the evidence will show, the evidence will show, the evidence will show before, between the facts that you're laying out. And you can go into storytelling mode in order to lay out those facts. Now, there are typically two stories that need to be told in any opening statement. Two fact patterns or narratives that will help the jury understand what it is that's happened. One of the stories is a story about what your client did in this case. It's a story that presumably if you tell it in a very, very clear way is a story that will help the jury walk in your client's shoes from what, what it is that they did and what they saw and what they heard and what they felt. On the other hand is the story of the other side and what it is that the other side did. And I want to mention to you the choice that you have as to where to start. Now, I would have to say to you that the conventional wisdom in plaintiff's personal injury cases for years used to be that you started with the story of the plaintiff, especially the family member who had lost um, a child that's been hit by a car or a situation where a, a family member who is dealing with loss of consortium issues is dealing with the loss of a particular plaintiff in a case. And so you tell the story from the perspective of the loss. You describe the day when the incident happened. Let's pick September 15th of 2006. It's a bright, clear day. In fact, the mother is out in the yard and she is sleeping up some leaves and her son, who's two years old, is out playing there with her. And in fact, then what happens is, is that she's fixing some leaves and the two-year-old, unbeknownst to her, chases a ball that has gotten away from him and is blowing, and it's blowing out between the cars and out into the street. And she hears a screech, it breaks, and a, hum, a thump, a, a, a sickening thump that tells her that a two-year-old has been hit. And she rushes over to it. And you can see that the story then is told from the moment of before and after and what it is that that person is experiencing in the way of seeing the death of a child. Now the problem that we find is that if you start in that telling in all the jury focus groups that we have been able to examine, there is a danger, there's a risk that in starting there what the jurors are thinking is couldn't the mother have paid more attention to where the child was when she was raking those leaves. And the theory is called attribution theory. The theory is, is that the jury may attribute responsibility to the first party that they hear from because they are so hungry to assign responsibility that hearing first about the mother makes them attribute responsibility to that person. Now, the thinking then is that is starting to emerge is that maybe it's better to talk about first the driver who is in the automobile, how he's driving in a place where he's not been before, where he doesn't know whether kids play, and that he's driving at a speed that's over the speed limit, that his mind is distracted, and all of those things before we tell the narrative about the child and the child and the parent and how the child got hurt. And the idea is, I would say, as a con the conventional wisdom that's emerging is to start by negative politicking by first telling the narrative about your opponent, case against the opponent first, and then follow it up with the third per and tell it in a third person from an omniscient point of view, so that you're telling it as if you are above it and you are God and you're looking down and you are seeing about what it is that he was doing and what he was thinking and why it is that he ought to be responsible for, for the case. And that that telling of the story, the conventional wisdom is to lead with that and then go ahead and tell the story about your side and what it is that you believe happened. Note here that one technique that's very effective as you go to your side of the case 
is if you can tell them that story from a first person perspective by putting yourself into the role of being that person. That in fact, with an introductory phrase that will say, now you will hear from the parties in this case, and this is what happened, that in fact Mrs. Jones was and is out in the yard. She is raking, and as she's raking, she has a two-year-old who is playing next to her with a ball. It's a cool September 15th day, the wind is blowing, and she's waking along and suddenly she notices that the two-year-old is chasing a ball and she turns to run after the child and the child runs out chasing that ball between two cars out into the street and to her horror she sees a Cadillac being driven down the street and that Cadillac seems to be zinging along and she hears the screech of brakes and oh wham. And so you can see that the power of the story is by telling it in the first person that allows the jury to put themselves into the mother's shoes as she walks. Note here that opening statement prohibits you from expressly asking the jury to put yourself in the shoes of your client. But the first person telling is then a literary technique, a storytelling technique that helps the jury walk through it. And you may try that as a technique in telling the story. These stories are very easy for you to tell. Again, there's no need for notes. Once you have dropped yourself into the point of view of the storyteller that you want to point in, then you take it from there. Pay attention to the verb tense and you're in good shape. And that telling of the story is something that will have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Though I would urge you to realize that, think about it cinematically. What is the best order for the telling of that story? Do you need to do flashbacks or flash forwards? Do you need to talk about the characters in a way to give it the, the case its context? And where are you going to do that? And how are you going to do that? And how do you indicate to the jury that you're leaving the story for a moment to tell them about one of the things that's important for them to understand? And simply, I would just urge you to do is to make that flashback apparent or the flash forward apparent. Members of the jury, let me flash ahead in these events and tell you what the evidence will show ha we, we need to know about what eventually happened to this individual. And so you do it, you do it explicitly, and then you tell that story and then you drop back. Now let's go back and let's pick up as to where we were before in our events on the day of September the 15th. That the two stories then will help you organize what it is that you want to say and to present the case in a conversational tone that allows the jury to see the underlying fairness of the case. Now, as you're going through this process of telling the stories on a dark, dark and uh, stormy night, on a busy afternoon in January of January 6th of 2006, Jenny Young is sitting at her desk and she has got a lot on her plate. She's got uh, a number of orders that are coming in and she gets a phone call out of the blue that pulls her away from what it is that she's doing. And on the phone is a fellow who says his name is Michael Lou Bell. And as you're telling those stories, you should keep an eye on how those stories are going to fit your theme of the case. And the theme statement of the case, I'd suggest you can be introduced. It can be introduced way up top at the very beginning of your opening statement. And let me jump up there and talk to you as to how it might look. Members of the jury, this case is about playing by the rules and following the rules. It's about whether or not Minicom, in its asking for parts that BMI manufactures, played by the rules in the way that it asked for those parts, and whether it ought to be responsible for the loss of those parts when its shipper, the shipper it picked, lost those parts. Now I want to talk to you then about what happened on January the 6th. So what you do is you state your theme over the top. And there's a rule of thumb that most trial lawyers have in the back of their head. You usually have got about 30 seconds in your statement of your theme in this case. And why is that? It's because just before you stand up for opening statement, what happens in most courts is that the judge says the following. The judge will say, members of the jury, counsel may address you directly with their opening statements. Counsel is allowed to preview for you what the evidence will be and what the issues are that are in this case. 
And so when you stand up, what you will have is you'll have an opportunity now to preview the issues. And this is a way of previewing by setting your theme off the top. Be careful because you need to also remember that the theme statement, while it's important to get that out as a matter of persuasion, cannot turn into an argument. This is not the time to start the case by saying, members of the jury, Minicom was clearly incompetent and obviously out of its league. It was a minor league player who was playing in a major leagues. And we will show you that through their incompetence and their total inability to conduct the business, what everybody else does, that they cause the harm to themselves and should be responsible for that harm. And so by putting the words obviously and clearly and moving into argument, remember that would violate the, the conversational tone and the direct tone. And you want to make sure that when you state your themes, you state them in that conversational tone and stay away from argument. Again, while you've got about 30 seconds to set your main point in this case, if you're mini-com, you might be able to say, members of the jury, this case is about a big company. Simply is taking advantage of the fine print in one of its sales documents to try to avoid taking responsibility for living up to its promises. Now that can be said directly and conversationally, but remember that, in fact, that'll turn very quickly into argument if what you can't do is to place what it is that you're saying into the mouth of one of the witnesses or into one of the exhibits that's in the case. If you can place what you say into the mouth of a witness, and this can include an expert witness. For example, in the Minicom case, if you are giving an opening statement about the damages that are incurred in this case, and you can put those damages into the mouth of your expert, the expert then, in fact, can be the source of your statements about what harm it's caused and how it's disrupted the flow of the business. Again, you can use that. It's a preview of what the expert says, and so you can use that in your narratives without violating the argument rule. But you may not. Argue the inferences, what it is that you infer from that about what it is that the person did. And you may stay, and you should stay with the rule that unless you can place it into the mouth or into the exhibits, that what you say is going to probably be argument and be something that may draw an objection. So your themes are themes that you can state at the beginning of the case, and frankly, you can state a number of times as you go through the case. So, the question is, did Minicom play by the rules? So the question is, did Minicom understand that the risk of loss passes in their failure to get a blanket risk of loss policy? Is that, in fact, evidence that they did not play by the rules or understand the rules of playing in the business? So you can weave your theme in, especially by using a series of refrains that are questions to be able to give completeness to it. But again, recognize that you're not allowed to argue the case and a, an argument may draw an objection. Repeat your theme, use it as a refrain, use it as a transition from one point to the other, and, uh, and when you say it, treat it like poetry. Practice then saying it. Practice saying your theme, playing by the rules. Or practice saying the theme, the meaning of five words. And that will help you be able to slow it down and to articulate it clearly and unapologetically. So often young lawyers, they get very good phrases, but they just blow through it so quickly that we never really get a chance to understand what it is that they have to say. Now the opening statement structure has the same kind of feature to it. If you've got some stories to tell or different narratives to tell, preview it. Again, be careful that especially if you're a defendant that you can see the human emotion that may be in the case, that you want to look cinematically at the chronology as if, in fact, you were producing a movie to help you understand what parts of the various narratives you want to tell and in what order. What paints the bad guy as a particular bad guy with a black hat and all of the things that go along with it. What facts then should you front about that person so that we get a clear idea of what your attitude is about that person? And sim similarly, cinematically, what facts do you lay out first when you're telling the story of your client to help ensure that the client's story and narrative is heard and understood in an empathetic and cinematic way? 
One of the toughest things to get right with openings is how much detail to give. You don't want to take too much detail because it takes away from the interest and understanding of what it is that's going to be said by the witnesses on the stand. You want to get the detail just enough right to persuade without too much detail. I think, for example, that it's fair in the BMI versus Minicom case to say simply that, in fact, Chris K was away, if you were representing Minicom, was away from the office. He was away in the office because he was being considered for a very important promotion and not say that that promotion involved an increase in pay from 150,000 to 180 to 210,000. You do not need that level of detail in your opening statement. As you're doing your editing and trying to figure out how much detail to provide in a given case, boy, if you can do a single day case opening in about seven minutes, seven to ten minutes, that should be your goal. You'd love to be able to get the juror's attention and keep that attention for about the length of time that it takes before the first commercial when they're watching TV. To keep that attention and give them the direction that you need, if you can boil your opening statement down to 10, 15 minutes with a, with a break in the middle, with a transition or a change or the seeing of an exhibit, then you're hitting at the right length of time for a good opening statement. Also, if you do have something that's more complex, remember that preview will allow you to get fresh starts as you go along. As long as you give them that preview, they won't be disappointed when you end one of the sections because they'll be aware that there's another section that's coming. And again, I can't overemphasize this, but in opening, especially if the court allows it, it is perfectly fine for you to show a couple of your key two or three exhibits that are your most important exhibits. Remember that the jurors are trying to sort out the rightness and wrongness, and if you can show them as well as tell them, then using an exhibit to be able to do that and to say, you'll be able to see this. This is going to come into evidence. You'll be able to get this in your hands when you get in the jury room. But let me just preview what this exhibit will show you. It will provide you with this language very directly. And so use the exhibits for emphasis as you're thinking about your narrative and the structure of your narrative. And then what you do in your end of your opening is to be able to look the jury in the eye and tell them what you're going to expect from them at the end of the case. Now one nice technique for a way to think about your big finish is to think what are the three questions that I can leave this jury that if in fact they see this case and answer these questions my way then we will be in a position to ask you for the verdict that we're looking for. So from the perspective of Minicom, is it true that in fact they had only one transaction, that the meaning of that one transaction in September informs the words that were used in January? So we need to first show you, did we have a September transaction where insurance was requested? Number two, the second question is, did Michael Lubell ask for insurance from BMI when he placed this call in January. And number three, has, does the words that are used in the exhibit D20, do those words amount to a request for insurance that puts BMI on notice of their insurance obligations? And so if you break out three issues for the jury, that you believe capture the heart of this case and line up your evidence along those three and then you say if we show you these three things we will ask you for damages and ask you for the amount of damages that will provide us with and make up for the fact that BMI failed to deliver on its promises and that that verdict that you're requesting can be a big finish in the light of these three issues. What that does for you then is, in closing, is your ability to go ahead and come back to those three questions and organize your proof according to those questions. I think of this as a famous trial lawyer, his name is Fred Bartlett in Chicago, is the Fred Bartlett approach to list the key questions, the key areas of proof, and then put a check off by it when the proof comes in, each one of these things during the trial, and go on closing argument to, those, to that chart and prove and show that you have done what you promised to do. Then the selection of these three questions is key and your ability to deliver on that has to be also airtight or uh, bulletproof to be able to make sure that you're able to do that. 
And that's one way then of thinking about your closing of your opening that sets you up for your closing that allows you to then end with an unapologetic statement to the jury, members of the jury, when we come back at the close of this case, if we prove these three issues, we'll ask you for a verdict in favor of our client. Thank you.